Please be seated. I found my stool. <laughs> I thought I was looking for it over there. It was right there. <laughs> I am, as I sometimes do, taking the posture of a teacher rather than a preacher today. I have some things I want to say. But as, as is the posture of rabbis who often sit in a seated or teach from a seated position, it's to indicate that we're all still learning, right? And I'm still learning too. Things are unfolding in, in my understanding, but I have some questions I want to pose and some things I want to say, and I want to do that from here. So let's find what we find today. It's been, a lot's been on my mind this week. Um, some of the Supreme Court decisions, uh, what we, the civil rights um, issues that seem to be rolling back, especially those affecting our LGTB, LGBTQ brothers and sisters all over the country. And um, just, just a, a, a sentiment of, uh, of, of those kinds of things that have been on my mind. And I, and I wondered what this scripture might have to say to us. And that's what I want to talk about today. Um, the first thing I'll say is some things bear repeating. Some scriptures are repeated over and over again in different contexts in our scriptures, and we have one of those today. So turn in your bulletin to page six and look for Psalm 145 and look at those first few lines. It says, the Lord, your God, is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger, and of great kindness, the word in Hebrew here is hesed, hesed, which means loving kindness. The Lord is loving to everyone. Now, I encourage you to take this bulletin home with you today or tear this page out and save it. Stick it on your mirror or your refrigerator or wherever it is that you will see this every day. Commit these lines to memory or burn it on your brain or etch it in your heart. Repeat it and pray these words every day. Why am I saying this? Because this is the very definition of God. It is a formula. That's how it appears in our scriptures. It's, it's, it's literally a definition. And these words are repeated over 20 times in different parts and places of the Bible, written by different people spanning thousands of years. They're found in the earliest books of the scripture, in the Torah, the law, in the books of Exodus and Deuteronomy. They appear at least six times in our Psalms, and this is one of them. They appear in five of the prophets, in Hosea and Joel and Daniel and Jeremiah and Isaiah. And then in the New Testament, they're repeated in Ephesians and in the book of James. These are very important, sacred, holy, fundamental, foundational words. Who is God, we may ask? What is God like? Well... The Lord our God is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great kindness, loving kindness. Our God is loving to everyone. Some things bear repeating. This is the foundation of everything. If you want to be a follower of Jesus, if you want to be a disciple, that takes on this way of life, if you want to be a person, a, a person of faith who loves God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength, then you have to know who God is. This is who God is. Now, there are a lot of voices, even religious voices, who will present a counter message who carry a very different definition of a God who is vengeful, full of wrath, punishing, a God who loves and rewards some and who damns others. 
Some who will say and believe that when good things happen to us, it's because we have done something to deserve it. And the flip side of that, when people live with hardship or experience poverty or who are under subjection, that they have done something to deserve it. But these ideas are not reserved for religious extremists. Sometimes they make their way into the hearts of very good and well-meaning people. Sometimes they make their way into our minds and hearts. And Jesus has something to say about that. Now, there aren't too many times in the scriptures where Jesus gets angry, but today is one of them. He's angry in this scripture. If you want to read it over, you will find an angry Jesus. He is uh, really hot. And the question is, why? Well, we would have to look back a few chapters. Jesus had just healed a man who had been paralyzed. Jesus says to him, take up your mat and walk. And the man does. But the religious leaders who were looking on this whole scene, watching this happen, get upset by this. So the question is, why in the world would anyone be upset at somebody who's been restored to healing, to a miracle? Why would that be upsetting? Well, they're mad, they say, because Jesus performed this miracle on the Sabbath day when any kind of work was prohibited. So they're mad because Jesus broke a rule that they have been working all along to follow. Does that make sense? Okay. A very few verses later, Jesus invites a man named Matthew to be one of his, his inside group, his closest disciples. And to be fair, Matthew his job had been to collect taxes on behalf of the Roman Empire. He was part of the enemy, right? And so we might think that the religious leaders would be upset about that, that he would ask someone with that background to be one of his closest disciples. But no, they're been out of shape out of, because of something else. They're mad because the way that Matthew chose to celebrate his new life with Jesus was to throw a big party and to invite everyone. The religious leaders are upset because the guest list included prostitutes and sinners who they didn't believe deserved to be there. When it gets right down to it, the religious leaders are upset about Jesus changing the script that they have been following. And they're upset because Jesus is giving something away to people who they don't believe deserve it. And at this, Jesus pushes back really hard. Hear this, Jesus always reserves his harshest criticism for those who try to protect their own power, their own position, their own moral superiority at the expense of other people. Don't do that, Jesus says. And for heaven's sakes, don't do that in the name of God. Because that's not who God is. Remember who God is. Our God is gracious and full of compassion and slow to anger and full of loving kindness. And our God is loving to everyone. That's the definition. And then Jesus essentially asks them, why are you doing this? Why are you grumbling? Why are you comparing notes and deciding who deserves what? Why? I played the flute for you, the same songs for you, he said, but you didn't dance. I wept for you, I wailed for you, but you didn't mourn. 
You have seen people be healed. You have seen them be transformed right before your eyes. A man who couldn't move stood up and picked up his mat and walked. But you're hung up because I did that on a Saturday instead of a Wednesday? Really? Matthew, who was once despised, is now part of a beautiful community who loves him. And in his gratitude, he invited all those who were outcasts to join in that feast. But you resent their presence? You're upset by their place at the table? Really? He's saying, stop it. And I think we need to hear Jesus saying this too, and not just think he's saying that to those people, those other people who are harsh and judgmental, or saying it to the Pharisees. We need to hear Jesus saying this to us. Stop and take a good, hard look. Anytime you, have, you find yourself feeling envious of the generosity or the blessing or the justice that someone else is receiving. When you find yourself grumbling and resentful at their presence at the table. Next, Jesus calls out their hypo hypocrisy and their inconsistency. He says, look, you call John the Baptist the greatest prophet of all time, a crazy man because he fasts. And then you call me a glutton and a drunkard because I feast. Which is it? Neither the one nor, who fasts nor the one who feasts can please you. Nothing can satisfy you. Jesus is calling them out. And sometimes it's good to have Jesus call us out too, right? And you bet Jesus is angry. And here's what I've heard him saying to me through the Holy Spirit this week, and I want to share it with you. Any time that religion becomes more focused on doctrines and rules and prohibitions than on mercy and compassion, and justice and loving kindness, then that religion is not from God. That religion is not from God. Jesus did not come to start a religion. Jesus told us the first day of his ministry that he came to proclaim good news to the poor and to heal the sick, and to release the captive, and to bring sight, to open our eyes to the things that we had not yet, we had not seen before. Jesus is saying to us, you are not at liberty to heap heavy burdens on people or to do anything to keep others in a place that is separate from or below you or to resent their presence when they ascend to yours. Do you hear Jesus saying this? And you are certainly not at liberty to do that in the name of God. Don't do that. Because our God, by definition, is gracious and full of compassion and slow to anger and filled with loving kindness and our God is loving to everyone. Some things bear repeat. Folks, in our lifetimes, in the coming years and right now, the grip is tightening, the squeeze is happening Protections are being removed from the most vulnerable. And lots of this is going to be done, is being done, 
in the name of God. But hear this, anything that tightens the screws on the back of the poor or the oppressed or the fragile or the sick or the widow or the orphan or the stranger is not of God. How do we know this? Because in today's gospel, Jesus looks right past the grumblers and the religious leaders and the self-righteous and the satisfied and even the well-meaning. He looks right past them at those who are being cut out and those who are hurting and the ones who have the most to lose. And he says to them, you come to me, you who are weary and who are carrying heavy burdens and I will give you rest. Because my burden is light. My yoke is easy. Make of that what you will.